Thinking about traveling within the United States this summer? Well, maybe you thought you'd catch a lecture or two at one of the many open college amphitheaters to hear a political speaker, maybe. Well, here's my suggestion. Don't, because there's a group of people who now say that violence will be increasing against those who are deemed fascist. You are now listening to The Spearsy Spin with your host, Mike Spears. Well, who are the anti-fascist people anyway? They appear to be a subjective group of individuals, many millennials who are in stark opposition to what they feel are fascist ideologies as a whole. Anti-fascism actually began in, well, the European areas back in 1924. Today, we see anti-fascists all around the world. Well, good evening, folks, and welcome to the Spearsy Spin. Now, tonight, we're not only looking at fascists as they present themselves to us on the streets, but we now have sketchy but informative information that suggests that anti-fascist groups are being driven by a group of quiet hatreds perpetrated by socialist as well as radicalized Middle Eastern influence. Now, how do we know this? Well, because there's many of the folks who were anti-fascist who have now left those ranks and now they're talking. So when we see this group of anti-fascists showing up for Trump rallies and similar Republican get-togethers, they most commonly show up wearing black ninja style clothing and usually have their faces covered. Now, one would have to wonder if, if you're 100% committed to your beliefs, why cover yourself up like a ninja? Well, here are just a few things that we have learned from confidential, anonymous, former anti-fascist. First, the black attire is to keep anyone from knowing the identity of the fascist members. Secondly, the black ninja-styled suits are in concert with a type of uniform ideology. You know, kind of like black ops stuff, I guess. Now, it affords the anti-fascists also to identify one another, especially when one of them is getting beat up. They know where to go to help out their, their friend, I guess. Now, I believe it also affords a psychological lift with regard to the self-esteem of some of the anti-fascists. It affords them an opportunity to be something bigger than themselves. As you know, I write the commentary for this show, and I always try to approach all the stories we do on a fair and balanced approach. Also, I try to identify issues, problems, and political blemishes, but I also try to provide an educated resolve to indifferences. With that said, here's a small sampling of countries where the anti-fascists have used their influence to make changes and to record their carbon footprint, if you will, into the history books. Now, of course, here in the United States, most Americans are fed up with the anti-fascist folks, but the same hate-spewing, maligned group of orators who decry unsubstantiated diatribes was once a needed cause. Now, for example, during the Second World War, a gentleman by the name of Benito Mussolini came into power under the guise of Adolf Hitler. So, as you know, the folks in Italy reached a point and decided that the fascist Mussolini, well, they figured his time in power had to end, and eventually, well, they abruptly hung him. During this time, those anti-fascists then were known as the Italian Resistance Movement. In Italy, Benito Mussolini brought to power a group of secret police. Their mission? To ensure the repression of anti-fascism. In short, they were to eliminate those who opposed the fascist Benito Mussolini. Of course, the anti-fascists had plans of their own, and they became violent burning, bombing, and murdering. 
As Italian fascism spread under Mussolini, the National Fascist Party's ideology was met with militant opposition by communist and socialist. This is when the anti-fascists became more violent. Meanwhile, as fascism developed, fascism, excuse me, developed and grew more and more, we've seen the anti-fascist folks growing in number. For example, um, in the, the Balkans and, and uh, Albania, it was a big thing back then because there was so much turmoil within those countries, and it didn't stop there. Now, during the 1930s, Britain had its hands full with both the fascist and the, the anti-fascist. Of course, we have only talked about Italy so far, but the anti-fascists have been with us for a long, long time. You've seen them all across North Carolina. They come from all origins and backgrounds, just like you and me. They work on farms, in hotels, shops, in your neighborhood. But when you look closer, you'll see it's not by choice. Human trafficking victims are forced, fooled, or frightened into performing labor or sex acts for money. You can help when you know what to look for. Learn the signs of human trafficking at projectnorest.org. In fact, Here's just a short list of where they popped up. The Slovenians at one point became intensely disenfranchised under the attempted rule of Italy while under Mussolini. The actions of the anti-fascists were helpful in bringing Benito Mussolini down. Now, next we want to talk about the German resistance to Nazism and Hitlerism. In the 1920s till about 1933, the Weimar Republic Communist Party and Social Democratic Party members called for violence and mass revolts. But not to be outdone, history shows us that the civil war in Spain was waged with the use of anti-fascist. And that was all the way back then as well. However, it appears that they had other names for them, that I can't mention here. Now in France, we have what is translated as the AF, and that stands for the French Action in America, and no fellas, it's not that type of action. Now the French Action here is a French far-right political movement. This movement was founded by Maurice Pujol in 1899 as a nationalist reaction against the intervention of left-wing intellectuals. Oh, well, I say, almost tea time, old chap. Well, tea time almost became a moot point as the UK had their own issues against the Mosleys. Now, there's actually a, a case in the early courts of the UK of Mosley versus the United Kingdom. Uh, in this instance, we had uh, those who felt the ruling government of the UK was in some ways appearing to be capitalistic and fascist with regard to privacy and human rights. So the European Court of Human Rights heard arguments brought forth by the anti-fascist folks on human rights. <laughs> An application to the court was made by Max Mosley, who at the time was the former president of the FIA following his successful breach of con uh, confidence. And basically, he was supposed to keep a bunch of stuff quiet, and he didn't. Now, that was a whole lot about mostly nothing, but it was a landmark case. Nonetheless, in the United Kingdom, we don't have time to go through all that, but we do have time <clears throat> to talk about this next issue. As you know, in the United States, we hear uh, all these phobias coming up. You know, there are homophobia and um, transphobia. Uh, I, I can't even remember all the phobias. But there's there was another one here uh, that surprised even me, and it's Germanophobia, Germanophobia, which, of course, is anti-German sentiment. And when we look at Germanophobia... <laughs> it's a fear of Germany, its, its inhabitants, its culture, and even the people. Now, 
as a political power, anti-German sentiment became widely accepted from the 19th century when the unification of Germany, Germany rose to a world power. Of course, no one faulted the anti-fascists for this one, because I guess we were all anti-fascists back then when it came to rising up against Germany. Since the Second World War, uh, you know, we've seen an insurgency in the, the anti-fascists across the globe. The bigger picture here is what is the hidden agendas in the anti-fascist movements and who is really pulling the strings? Well, we take a look at Sweden. Now, now Sweden, uh, as, as we look at them and we push to find out more about these pesky anti-fascists, the name anti-fascist appears to be first, year, <laughs> first used many, many years ago. It was then that activists put an end, of course, to the Nazi marches that were in uh, Sweden because they commemorated the death of Sweden monarch Charles X, excuse me, the 12th. At one point, the anti-fascist folks posted a congratulatory writ that reads as follows. Your daughter just had her first breakup. Do you A, put yourself in her shoes? B, console her? Don't worry, sweetie. This is gonna happen a lot. Or C, find her a new boyfriend. Nice, single boys. <laughs> that was weird. As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. We are many who, during all these years, have stood shoulder to shoulder in the fight against a capitalist society which we want to transform by revolutionary means into a state and classless society. We have struggled together for a just and equal society using these methods that we have considered necessary. To celebrate our 20th year anniversary, we decided to carry out coordinated actions all across Sweden. We chose to act against targets related to the four pillars underlying our activities, namely resistance to capitalism, racism, homophobia, and sexism. They go on, we want to send warm greetings to all the comrades who have fought together with us, as well as all those who have supported, cheered us on, and provided us with solidarity during these last 20 years. Hmm. Well, that sounds absolutely lovely. However, I would like to point out key phrases and buzzwords here that you should pick up on, and I certainly have picked up on, and I want to share them with you now. Now, in the memorandum that we just read, the first thing that pops out is capitalist society. Why did this group use the words capitalist society? Next, a state and classless society. Again, why? Next phrase, using those methods we have considered necessary. Now, over here in America, you probably remember, we have another anti-fascist group. Um, was it BAM or BAN? Uh, by all means necessary. Yeah, I think it's BAM. Um, so you can see there's, there's uh, a, a similarity here of, of thinking. The next phrase that we pulled out of the memorandum that you just heard was coordinated actions all across Sweden. Um, that is actually a power statement. And uh, what I mean by that is, is that it is to uh, induce the thought that these folks are so large and, uh, you know, so large in, in numbers that they have uh, effectively covered the entire country of Sweden. Next, to act against targets. What that simply tells us is that they, they view anyone that is not of their ideology as a target. Next, 
their resistance to capitalism, racism, homophobia, and sexism. And we hear that same prattle here today in the United States. And send warm greetings to all the comrades. Well, that's a strange thing to say in a memorandum, I would think. And then the last buzzword, solidarity. Now, here's the deal. Those key phrases and buzzwords, they're not new. As a matter of fact, when we look back into the 1940s here in the United States, during a time when our FBI was out and about looking for the Reds. Now, if you're under 50, the Reds is a slang term for communist. These are the same phrases and key words used by the communist way back then. So, what's changed now? Well, lots has changed while nothing has changed. Wow, how insightful, right? But what I mean to say is this. The far left, who have shown themselves to be liberals a prose, have been, for the most part, under the influence of socialism. However, a very high majority of those identifying as liberal do not understand the hidden agendas of the socialist program. Of course, there are those liberals that not only understand the socialist agenda, but endorse it. So, we've talked about the anti-fascists this evening, and I wonder why the horrible language is needed when they confront uh, those folks on the opposite side of their beliefs. And if you've had a chance to see you know, any raw footage, uh, I'm talking about here in the United States, for instance, at a Trump rally and the anti-fascist folks show up, the language from these folks is atrocious. Now, with that said, not long ago in Boston, there was a strong show of force between Trump supporters and the anti-fascist folks. Again, several arrests, some injuries, but the attitudes are changing. There seems to be a more vindictive emotion being displayed by the anti-fascist folks. Not long ago in Portland, Oregon, a police officer was assaulted as pro-Trump and the anti-fascist folks squared off again. We have a big problem, and we need your help. It's happening on college campuses, at bars, at parties, even in high schools. It's happening to our sisters and our daughters. Our wives and our friends. It's called sexual assault, and it has to stop. We have to stop it. So listen up. If she doesn't consent, or if she can't consent, it's rape, it's assault. It's a crime. It's wrong. If I saw it happening and I was taught, you have to do something about it. If I saw it happening, I speak up. If I saw it happening, I'd never blame her. I'd help her. Because I don't want to be a part of the problem. I want to be a part of the solution. We need all of you to be part of the solution. This is about respect. It's about responsibility. It's up to all of us to put an end to sexual assault. And that starts with you. Because one is too many. And not that long ago, an anti-fascist hate Trump organizer named Lacey McCauley decided to show the world that all Middle Eastern Muslim men are kind, compassionate, and respect women's rights. So, she started dating a Turkish gentleman, and everything appeared to be fine. You know, love was in the air and all that. Well, at some point, the Turkish boyfriend decided that he wanted to go back home for Turkey for a visit, and he asked, uh, asked his girlfriend, Lacey, to come along, and she did. Now, she explains that the first two weeks were fine, but then, suddenly and mercilessly, she said she was beaten and sexually assaulted over and over by her Turkish boyfriend. Also, she claims that she was arrested when she had gone out by herself to hear the Turkish president give an open-air speech. She spent a couple days in jail before being released. However, 
She was luckier than most, as she is still alive and back home in the United States. Now, Lacey McCauley has attended Trump rallies as an anti-fascist leader. She's also attended town hall-style meetings with Michael Moore. And not long ago, Ms. McCauley posted this as her mission statement of sorts. It reads, Anarchy is based on a mutual consent, and the so-called violent aspect of black blocks and anarchism is really in a state that needs to be understood. I mean, can you really commit an act of so-called violence against a window? Or is it an act of violence of something that you commit against a person? What most people in the black block would say is that it is not violence to break a window. And that is kind of her mission statement, her being Lacey McCulley. Now, you can actually Google her, and uh, you'll find that she rolls up there uh, in many of the anti-fascist uh, blogs. We have a big problem, and we need your help. It's happening on college campuses, at bars, at parties, even in high schools. It's happening to our sisters and our daughters. Our wives and our friends. It's called sexual assault, and it has to stop. We have to stop it. So listen up. If she doesn't consent, or if she can't consent, it's rape, it's assault. It's a crime. It's wrong. If I saw it happening, I was taught you have to do something about it. If I saw it happening, I speak up. If I saw it happening, I'd never blame her. I'd help her. Because I don't want to be a part of the problem. I want to be a part of the solution. We need all of you to be part of the solution. This is about respect. It's about responsibility. It's up to all of us to put an end to sexual assault. And that starts with you. Because one is too many. Now today, to date, I have not seen anything that would tell me that she now understands that Middle Eastern countries, well, they don't have a proven track record for being true sponsors of women's rights. So the word on the street is that the anti-fascists are hearing a rebel call to become more aggressive and more violent. The result? Well, the result will be more lateral force by the police, and sadly, more lateral force by those who represent the interest of the United States of America and the Trump administration. Now, it appears to me that this is nothing more than a call to arms by the extreme liberal left and the anti-fascist, and that will bear the brunt of the casualties that being those on the front line, the anti-fascists, and sadly the police, and the, uh, the Trump supporters. You know, history has a way of repeating itself, as we've seen while we discussed other countries and the anti-fascist earlier. While there's, there's no denying that the need for anti-fascists have proven to be an immeasurable tool of resolve in other countries like the rebels versus the regime of modern-day Syria. However, these actions are neither just or warranted here in the United States. Let us know what you think. Visit us at thespearsyspin.blogspot.com and leave us your thoughts. Now, before I go, I wanted to let you know about some changes that we're making here at the Spearsy Spin. Now, this is technical stuff uh, that I know nothing about, so please bear with me. The Spearsy Spin Show typically requires 1.37 gigabytes per file. That's just to record it. The Spearsy Spin is recorded using Sony Pro and then reproduced by Vegas Pro. The audio is first recorded as a VGA file, compressed, and then rewritten into an MP3 format before being locked with its corresponding video components to be the final product known as MP4. Now, because of the number of medias that we are currently heard on, 
a decision has been made to keep the Spearsy Spin as an MP3 format. The reason for this is twofold. First, it will be quicker to convert the VGA files to MP3, and then these files will automatically now be converted to MP4. However, with the new formatting, medias that cannot upload MP4 files will be able to upload just the married MP3 file or the audio file, as it were. Now, what does this mean to you, you, our valued listener, you that push those buttons of subscribe, you that share our shows with uh, different folks? Um, well, just this. We will use this format until we go live sometime in 2018. And uh, again, if you haven't uh, heard uh, before in some of the other shows, we are looking to try to go live in January 2018. Now that means that on camera with um, an actual human, I guess the human's me, sitting there, and uh, we will actually uh, be live streaming video. Ah, yeah, can't wait. Once the show goes live, you can watch and listen on most of your media providers or if you can't get us on your media provider, you can stream the podcast just a few hours after the live shows begin. Now, we're going to be off the air Tuesday, starting at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we'll repost the show on Thursday, July 20th at 12 midnight. That's Eastern Standard Time. Well, while the system's down, we will reboot our recording software as well as update that software and we're going to update our computers that we need to render the finished shows. In a nutshell you will basically have the Spearsy Spin radio version now until 2018. So you're not going to see too many video clips. Um, there will probably be you know, a, um, I don't know, I'm just, now I'm guessing here, but I would imagine there'll be some sort of a, um, identity clip of some sort that, you know, who we are, or what, I, that I don't know. I'm, I don't know. <clears throat> well, that's all the technical stuff. I have no idea what it all means or what I just said, but I sure sounded good, and it, it makes it easier, I guess, for other medias to, to upload our, our files. I guess that's what's happening. At any rate, we're going to be back here on Thursday with the Spearsy Spin radio version. So please, tune us in. As always, thanks for your comments and, and all the stuff you do. You, you, make this, you make this job worth doing. Thanks, folks, and we'll see you all on Thursday. <laughs>